Hi guys, it's your science teacher here, back with another video. This time I'm going to go through the whole of the Activate One topic of reactions. I really hope you do enjoy the video, so let's get straight into it. Before we start looking at some different types of reactions, we need to know what exactly goes on in a reaction. Because there are two types of change that can happen. There is physical change uh, in which bonds are not broken and there is chemical change in chemical reactions in which bonds are broken and something new is made. So how do I know whether I've had a physical change or a chemical change and a reaction has happened? Well, physical changes are quite uh, easy to spot because they are often reversible uh, and you can uh, go back to what you started with. Some examples of these physical changes include any state change and state changes are things like melting, freezing, or evaporating. Other types of physical changes involve squeezing or stretching something. Imagine squeezing a sponge. It's going to really want to go back to its original shape, isn't it? Uh, and that change isn't permanent, is it? You can always go back to what you started with. Chemical changes, however, are a lot harder to reverse. This is because you are breaking and making bonds. Those atoms are rearranging. Even baking a cake is a chemical change. You start off uh, with a kind of liquidy dough, don't you? And um, once you have put it inside the oven, bonds are being broken, bonds are being made and you end up with a cake, don't you? And that cake has completely different properties to what you started with. And it's incredibly hard to go back to that sloppy dough that you had before. Other examples of some chemical changes are anything which involves burning and the chemical name for burning is combustion. And we're gonna have a look at some combustion reactions in a minute. Let's have a look at a specific type of reaction now, uh, and this is magnesium with oxygen in the air. One of my favourite type of reactions, and one that actually made me love science. When you heat up magnesium under a Bunsen burner, it starts to react with oxygen in the air and you get this beautiful light come off it and it's, it's quite spectacular. Uh, but what is actually going on uh, inside there? What's happening with the atoms? Well, what's happening is the magnesium... Well, what's happening is the magnesium uh, is reacting with the oxygen atoms in the air and they're becoming bonded. And what I'm doing now is I'm representing this with what's called a word equation. What is key to a word equation is the reactants are always on the left hand side of my arrow and my products are always on my right hand side of my arrow. We've looked at particle diagrams before in previous videos. So what I've done underneath the words is I've drawn the particles of magnesium and oxygen and shown what it actually looks like when they react together. You can see that the atoms have rearranged. They've gone from being in their separate element to being bonded in their compound. Also, what is important to see from the particle diagrams is no particles have been created or destroyed. What I mean by this is, look, there are four magnesiums on the left hand side of my equation and there are four magnesiums on the right hand side of my equation. There are also four oxygen atoms on the left hand side of my equation and four oxygen atoms on my right hand side of the equation. Because of the fact that you cannot create or destroy atoms, if you know the mass of magnesium 
and you know the mass of the magnesium oxide that you've made at the end of the reaction, you can actually calculate the mass of oxygen that it has reacted with. What I mean by this is, if you start off with burning 3 grams of magnesium, and you end up making 5 grams of magnesium oxide, then what that means is you must have reacted it with 2 grams of oxygen. This is because nothing can be created or destroyed. Everything is conserved. We conserve mass in science. I said we'd look at combustion reactions and we are on to that section now. So let's have a look at some examples of burning and combustion reactions. Whenever you have a fuel and you combust it, you react it with oxygen in the air. And this always makes the two products carbon dioxide and also water. These reactions often produce a lot of heat and you've probably experienced it before. You've probably been sat around a warm fire before and felt, oh, this is a little bit warm. We often burn fuels in order to create energy. And these fuels that we burn are called fossil fuels. The reason that they are called fossil fuels is because they were formed millions of years ago. Some examples of fossil fuels are coal, oil and natural gas. Now, just like I said on the last slide, whenever we burn these fuels, we make water and we make carbon dioxide. You've probably heard that carbon dioxide is not very good for our environment. The reason why carbon dioxide is said to not be very good for our environment is because of the fact it causes global warming. This is the warming of our planet and it's causing ice caps to melt it's causing extreme climate and it's causing extreme weather conditions which are very unpredictable such as the wildfires in California that happened and it's also causing a loss of biodiversity. Basically what I mean by this term of biodiversity is I mean that animals are not having time to adapt to the changing conditions and therefore they are dying out and becoming extinct. So releasing lots of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere is incredibly bad. So you might be thinking, why do we burn fossil fuels in order to get our energy? And there is a few reasons why we do this. One, they generate a lot of energy and we have such a large population and a growing population uh, that we need to keep burning fossil fuels in order to provide enough electricity. We also use it for transport in our cars. You like going to see um, your friends on holiday and you like uh, traveling around the country. Well, that is con contributing to climate change by putting carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. Also, we've used coal for a long time and we know that it's incredibly reliable. It produces enough energy to match our current demands. In addition to this, um, we all already have the technology uh, in order to use it. So it does have a few advantages and that is why we currently use it to generate our electricity and we use burning in our cars. We're now going to look at a property called thermal decomposition and this property uh, basically means that you start off uh, with one reaction and you can end up with two products and here I have an example I have a metal carbonate here and I'm heating it up and when you heat up a metal carbonate you actually make two products you make carbon dioxide 
and you also make the metal oxide. These are really specialised reactions that you just need to know about and you need to know what products they make. And you also need to know how to carry it out. So here you can see I've got my Bunsen burner, I'm heating up my metal carbonate and when I do that it decomposes into two products. And I can test that I've actually made carbon dioxide. Uh, here's showing how you can have a delivery tube and this carries the gas, the carbon dioxide down into this lime water and the lime water goes from clear to cloudy and that proves that you've made carbon dioxide as your product. Another example of a thermal decomposition reaction is hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide when you uh, heat that up that goes into oxygen and water. You can see that I start with one reactant and it decomposes into two products. We are now going to look at two more other examples of reactions. That's why I love this topic. We're going to look at loads of different types of reactions and this time we are going to look at exothermic reactions and we are going to also look at endothermic reactions. And there's a really easy way to remember the difference between them. Exothermic sounds like exit. And the reason why I remember this is because energy exits your reaction. And endothermic, um, I like the end bit. Uh, it's kind of like in. Endothermic takes energy in. Now, if I look what that actually means for this reaction, with an exothermic reaction, that gives temperature out. And you can tell you have an exothermic reaction if the temperature goes up. With an endothermic reaction, however, the temperature of the reaction actually goes down during the reaction. And here I have some examples, don't I? So there's a hand warmer for an example of a exothermic reaction. And over here I have a cool pack, which is an example of an endothermic reaction. Because endothermic reactions take energy in, the products actually have more energy than the reactants. However, with an exothermic reaction where energy is exiting the reaction, the products have less energy than the reactants. Now, I hope you have enjoyed the video. That is the end of this one. Um, I'm really sorry that there's not more in this topic because I absolutely love doing reactions and talking about reactions with you guys. But please remember, if you did like the video, drop it a like. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel.